going to hand out to you. Thank you very much, uh, Chitra, and uh, thanks to Santosh and uh, to AIS for the PG program, which if you look up to, we look up to as well. So here we are to share knowledge that we think is possibly complete, but knowledge is never complete. And the more we understand, the more we know that how little we know. Do you think before the examination, you feel that you're totally well prepared? How about you? Before an examination, totally prepared. Answer every question. I never felt that. So it's, that is it. So each time that you read a book, you read a chapter, you read a section, you feel that there is something more that you have learned. And this is what knowledge is all about. So let's look into the advancement of cataract surgery. At one point of time, people who did couching thought that they are giving back that fantastic vision which a total cataract had lost. There was a total cataract, patient could not see anything, they couched that cataract and the patient saw everything. So at that point, that was the benchmark. But then came ECC and ICC and then microsurgery and then total magnification and we have Femto, we have the different lenses and it's been a huge journey between couching to Seiko and to flax. So now today as we stand here, what is the aim of cataract surgery? And this again is an important question that at times uh, examiner would ask you. What is th today, in this year, what do you think cataract surgery needs to do? So the important answer that is required from you is cataract surgery needs to address both the cataract as well as the refractive solution of the patient. So cataract is becoming actually a refractive surgery. And the multiple choices that we have, the opportunity of elective options to our patients give this difference between cataract surgery beyond previous and the cataract surgery that is done today. So at that point of time, cataract surgery was based on opacity. The lens has gone opaque, you need cataract surgery. But now it is based on even if the lens has not gone opaque and the patient is feeling trouble to do his day-to-day -day activities, he can go ahead with cataract surgery if there are no other ocular pathologies contributing to the deficiency of the vision. So here we have the intraocular lenses, thereby a, s a patient with 6 by 18 comes and says, I am not able to see well, I am not able to drive well, uh, there is too much of glare. So then you have to think that this patient after cataract surgery not only has to have good vision, best, better than 618 definitely, but also a good satisfaction of vision. Thereby the contrast sensitivity must be good and you have to be careful on the refractive aspects of cataract surgery. And how can you be assured of that? It is through these intraocular lenses that you have today and the selection today of the intraocular lenses are based not only on the lower order aberrations, but also on the higher order aberrations and the alignment of the intraocular lens. Thereby, you give the patient that satisfaction, that wow effect, yes, I can see well. So what is new about this IOL selection? And we know that spherical aberration, and we have seen these photographs many, many times, the spherical aberration and the, and the optical aspect of the focusing of the rays not at one focus, but at different foci, and this is the cause of the spherical aberration, and this gives an imperfect image. So here we are, the imperfectness of the lens that has been God-given, can we improve on that? And thereby comes in the spherical aberrations, and the higher order spherical aberrations are actually addressed. So if there is a, a myope, and this myope needs an aspheric IOL with a negative spherical uh, aberration. Why a negative? A quick answer, anybody? Why a negative spherical aberration IOL? What is, yes, someone said something? Uh, fantastic. The corneal aberration is positive. So we need to neutralize that positive corneal aberration. And what range would be the positive corneal aberration? Any idea? 
point two five, maybe point two seven to point three is usually what is determined as the positive corneal aberration. Therefore, the aspheric IOL with a negative uh, uh, spherical aberration is what is required. With a hyperopic patient, it is a spherical IOL because we do not want to increase any of this. If there is a decentration, then of uh, the uh, cataractus lens, then what we definitely need to have is an aspheric IOL with a zero spherical aberration. Thereby, the if there is uh, no decentration, then what the patient requires is sharp image quality, which is very, very critical, and the depth of focus is also very critical. So let's look at, so what do we have? We have this whole bunch of lenses, but this lens, the Technus and the IQ, these are the negative spherical aberration lenses, and thereby they give that wow effect. Wow, wow, it's looking so good. Envista is zero memory. Uh, spherical aberration. Now let's look into the abrometry and why should we look into the abrometry before going on to cataract surgery? Because why? Because we have these very high-end lenses, the multifocal lenses, the, the toric lenses, and abrometry plays an important part. So how does it, um, how does the abrometry play? So we have the eye trace, and the eye trace is a very important tool for us cataract surgeons, especially when you are addressing those patients who are uh, who want that huge satisfaction so it's also called a microscope of refraction and there's an integration of the auto refractometer the the, uh, the keratometry the topography and the abrometry and the pupillometry as well so it gives a very wide view a panoramic view of what we need for these high end patients so what does the eye trace actually do the higher order aberrations, and uh, can you name a few higher order aberrations quickly? Coma, right. Uh -huh. Tetrafoil, trifoil. So there are a lot of higher order aberrations. And the uh, eye trace actually separates these higher order aberrations. So what higher order aberration is contributed by the cornea, by the internal optics, and by the cataractus lens is what is given now. So here we are, here we have the uh, early cataract and this is uh, reflected in the lens aberrations, you can see that. And when we take up this, then we see that what is the higher order aberrations that this patient can have. And you can see that on your right hand side is the entire eye, the higher order aberrations depicted. If you look at the internal optics and compare it with the entire eye, what do you see? It matches, it more or less matches. And when you look at the cornea, and you see that the higher order aberration is not actually disfiguring this image. So it's a visual effect with which you can see that the total eye, the entire eye's higher order aberration is contributed by the internal optics. Therefore, you know that this patient after a cataract surgery is going to have good vision, These, those higher order aberrations are removed. <coughs> so the higher order aberrations, what are the complaints that a patient uh, tells of? So it, uh, they tell of halos, the glare, the night vision problems, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. if there's a decentered lens or if there's a tilted lens, or if a toric lens becomes rotated, then all this gives rise to the higher order aberrations and they cause difficult effects. Now the angle of the eye. Now the angles of the eye is very important and here we have the angle alpha, the kappa and the gamma. More important the al alpha and the kappa. The alpha is the angle between the visual axis and the optical axis. Kappa between the pupillary axis and the visual axis. Now why do these have effect? Let's look, have a look. Now here <coughs> if the intraocular lens is actually centered on the limbal center and it's not on the visual axis. Thereby, if there's a large angle alpha, so then what happens is this multifocal or, uh, or the toric which is supposed to be centered dot on then becomes compromised in vision. And the result, they have the blur and the double vision. Therefore, such patients, if they are detected early, should not go in for a multifocal or a toric, should go in for a monofocal lens. Now biometry. Let's look at biometry and the factors that determine it. So 
we used to do biometry, our technicians do biometry, we uh, get the lens that is required and they put the patient on the table, we do our job and finish. But today that's not it. Why? Because it's emerging that the refractive power of the cornea of the IOL, the length of the eye, and everything is very important, but what has a new term come in as the effective lens position. So this is very important to determine and the important formula is actually try and improve on the ability to predict our ELP so that we know that this is the correct power of the intraocular lens that is going into the eye. So what do you make of these two things? So the A scan and the optical biometry. So which is better? Which biometry would be better? Optical, why? So the, it's the answer is given there. So the in the A scan, what happens is you detect the range in the whole macula and para paramacular region, but the focus is not on the paramacular region. So therefore, if there is actually a, a problem with the paramacular region, a diabetic macular edema or something, then you are actually going on to a misinterpretation. Whereas the IL master or which is the optical biometer, it focuses or matches onto the fovea centrally. However, if there's a diabetic macular edema, say 491 microns of thickness of the macula, so what should you do? And the patient needs a cataract surgery, what would you do? A macular thickness of 491, patient has significant cataract, vision is dropping, patient says, Dr. Sab, amara cataract surgery kara do. What would you do? Go ahead and do a cataract surgery. With what, which formula? With which uh, machine are you going to check the biometry? IL master or the A scan? IL master. So would you do a cataract surgery in this patient is the first question that you have to think of. In a patient which has macular edema, it's the macular edema that you have to treat first if the patient's macular edema has subsided, then you need to think whether it is going to sustain and then if the patient is ready for cataract surgery, you need to do the cataract surgery, okay? And of course, the IL master is the better instrument to do the uh, calculation for the biometry. So these regression formulas, and we have all these different types of regression formulas, and they are getting confusing day by day, but ultimately, it's important that they are improving and we have the SRKT, the Holiday One, the Hopper Q, and they have different calculation formulas, but you can see that the Holiday Two occupies that whole length. But even better than the Holiday Two is the next formula, and that is the, the Barrett Universal Formula. And the Barrett Universal Formula has actually taken the front seat today. However, the Hopper Q is still used for the, uh, the AL length less than 21.5, between 21.49 and 25.01, holiday one and SRKT, uh, SRK2 is still used, holiday one with a one Cox adjustment greater than 25. This is done. However, Barrett's Universal 2 is a very important formula and that has really taken uh, most of the, why is it called universal? It's called universal because it addresses a very wide range of uh, the axial lens. So what is this? The, if a patient has undergone LASIK or uh, PRK, so what would you like to uh, do for this patient? How would you determine the biometry for this patient? So it's very difficult to determine the biometry in a post-refractive eye because what have you altered here? You have altered the, the corneal curvature. So you do not have the proper valuation or on the uh, evaluation of the standard formulae. So there are formulae which give you a good benefit, but also I want you to understand the ORB or the optical refractive biometry in which you do a, a refraction on the ephicic eye when the patient's cataract has been removed on the table. And you get an assessment with this with the ephicic mode and then according to the assessment, you can possibly get a range of lengths which possibly would suit. 
and with the other formula, you match them. If it suits, then you go ahead. And keeping these post-refractive eyes a little on the myopic or the hyperopic side. Would you like to err a little on the myopic side or the hyperopic side? Little on the myopic side, right. Because usually the surprise is on the hyperopic side, right. So customization of the premium IOLs, and we have the toric, the multifocal, the toric multifocal, the trifocals, the EDF lenses, which is called the extended depth of focus lenses, sulcoflex, accommodative, and innovative IOLs. So we'll uh, go through this quite fast. So it's important to uh, understand. So if there is an astigmatism more than one diopter, it, this patient is possibly a suitable candidate for the toric IOL. However, you would see that when you mark for a toric IOL, you, as Dr. Chitra said, you have to mark in the sitting position. And uh, if you mark with the tripan blue on uh, the slit lamp or uh, by your hand, then what have you done? You've put two spots over there. And those two spots are actually quite large and they can occupy a, a width. So, but the literature says that if there is a 10% align misalignment, it can lead to a loss of 33% of the cylinder of the toric. Therefore, those marks have to be very accurate. Mark it on the slit lamp, just not on the couch and just putting two marks like that. And uh, so that as accurate as possible and the alignment is also as accurate as possible. So uh, the very on, uh, Dr. Chitra spoke in great detail, so I will not repeat that. And uh, the ORS system is again a very important system and this is on the microscope mounted with an aperometer and it, it, it measures the refraction on the table and it guides to what intraocular lens you can give and that is a very, very important tool which gives a very fine accuracy. Let's look at the multifocals now. We started off with these multifocals which are called the refractive multifocals. Now the, with the refractive multifocals, there was a lot of halo and glare. Then came the diffractive multifocals which was an addition of the refractive lens and these caused the light to converge at two points and these, uh, this became a better multifocal. Why? because it caused less glare and halos. So why is a diffractive multifocal better? It's because of the less glare, halo, and a better contrast sensitivity. So these also multifocals come with a toricity. These are special multifocals and are quite expensive, but they have the toricity also. So these can be done with a patient with a high cylinder as well. Then comes this uh, ED of lens or the extended depth of focus lens. So have you heard of this extended depth of focus lens? Have you heard? Yes, no? Yes, okay. So what, what does this extended depth of focus mean? How can you extend the depth of focus? So you know in our optical system of the eye, there is a spherical aberration. There's also something called a chromatic aberration. Who said that? Yeah. So chromatic aberration is there and that chromatic aberration causes a blur of the image in the normal eye. So if you can cut out that blur, then what happens is the sharpness quality of the image improves. And that is what the principle of this EDF lens is and it improves the sharpness, decreases the blur and thereby this gives an extended depth of vision the patient can reach up to around 40 centimeters distance and this. But if you want the patient to read at 33 centimeters, that is not possible. And thereby th what they uh, suggest is a mix and match of the two lenses, two eyes. That is, if you can under correct one eye by 0.75 or uh, one diopters on the minus side, then it's a mix and match vision. So the patient gets that whole panorama of vision distance, middle and near with both eyes open and you have to explain this to the patient. If you are not explained, patient is not going to be happy at all. Now let's look at the trifocal and the trifocal has come in and uh, this is an excellent lens and it's a combination of two diffractive structures which give a single uh, foci and a very specific uh, foci and these have the convoluted diffractive steps which give 
this uh, trifocality, that is the distance, middle and near, ha is contributed to by the intraocular lens. Now, with the femtosecond laser, if you have a trifocal and if there is a cylinder, then what happens is the cylinder can be corrected, especially if it is up to 1.5 diopters of cylinder. There is something called an arcuate keratotomy which can be done with the femtosecond laser and thereby you can correct the cylinder and uh, you can place a trifocal in. So how much time do I have? Uh, one minute? Two, 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 minutes. two minutes, okay. So sulcoflex, quickly uh, uh, answer what a sulcoflex lens is. Where is it placed? Is it placed over the crystalline lens? Is it placed over another lens? Is it placed over the crystalline lens? No, it's placed if a, a, a pseudophagic eye and you have detected that this pseudophagic eye has an error if there's a high refractive surprise, then what you can do is place a sulcoflex lens, and this sulcoflex lens gives a way in which it corrects. So there's an intraocular lens over there, and the lens comes in, the first intraocular lens is in the bag, and the second one comes and sits in the sulcus, and can correct also a cylinder and the refractive error as well. So this is a also called a piggyback lens. Accommodative lenses we had, and these accommodative lenses were supposed to accommodate, but they did not really work so well. And these lenses are going out of fashion. Maybe they'll come up with better lenses. And uh, there is something that is a very interesting lens called the dual optic lens. And this is a lens in which the front optic, there are two optics here. The front optic comes as the plus 32, and the uh, the posterior optic is a variable minus optic. The Nishi lens, which is called the injectable lens, and uh, there is an injected material in there, and this was the first injectable lens that was there. So innovative lenses, the smart lens, the smart lens is something that's a hydro, uh, thermodynamic IOL which goes into the anterior chamber and then it unfolds out in the temperature in the milieu of the anterior chamber. The light adjustable Calhoun lens, this is again a very, very um, important lens, and with the light, it adjusts the power and gives the accommodation. But what is the most uh, interesting lens as of today? It's the electronic IOL or the Alenza Sapphire autofocus IOL. It has a battery, it has a photo sensor, and it can sense what amount of where you are viewing and what is to be the focus and it adjusts by itself and gives a good focus for all distances wherever the patient is supposed to look. So technology versus um, the science. Uh, tell me what this ring is, quickly. It's the BX ring. <laughs> Who created the BX ring? Bhattacharya, yeah. My very, very good friend, and I take this opportunity to say that uh, about 30 years ago, we used to ride pillion carry with each other on a bike that was half broken. So Bhattacharya created this ring, which is an excellent ring and is uh, very much used today. Femtosecond laser, it uh, gives uh, a lot of advantages. It gives specificity, it gives uh, significance, uh, gives an extremely round capsulotomy. You can break up the nucleus extremely well. You can soften it and you, the accuracy is the most important thing, less of phaco energy and endothelial cell damage. Yeah, just finishing. The zepto capsulotomy, again, the capsulotomy is a very sound and a firm one with the zepto, zepto machine. But here we are at the crossroads. We have so many things to think of. We have to embrace the latest technology, but also remember that empathy and care for the patient is the most important factor with all these technological advancements. And a gentle touch, understanding the patient, understanding the needs of the patient, and understanding the attitude of the patient is most important when you're going to compare, to collate both technology as well as the human touch, because without the human touch, because without you, technology is incomplete. Thank you very much for your patience.